Good morning. Today we're going to be continuing our series through the Gospel of Mark. And today is actually kind of an interesting passage uh, because it's kind of an aside in the midst of the Gospel, really looking at Jesus' life and ministry. And it's a, it's a passage that a lot of people over the years have asked, why would Mark decide to include this in the midst of Jesus' story? Uh, because it's not really about Jesus, although the Jesus is in it a little bit. Uh, it's kind of about what is going on in the midst of Jesus' ministry, and ultimately we see it play out uh, affecting him down the line. Uh, and so let's get into it. Uh, we're going to be in Mark 6. We'll be looking at verses 14 through 29. It starts off, King Herod heard of it. For Jesus' name had become known. And so this story is actually taking place immediately, immediately following last week's message that Pastor Craig gave uh, in which the disciples are sent out by Jesus to preach a gospel of repentance and also to perform miracles including casting out demons and healings. <clears throat> and so uh, what he has heard of is what the disciples are doing. It, this, this work that they are performing in Jesus' ministry is spreading far and it's reaching people of all uh, economic statuses, including uh, the king of the region, King Herod. And so, uh, and then what's really interesting is Jesus' name had become known. It's kind of just a beautiful picture that what the disciples are doing is ultimately glorifying Jesus. Even though at this point, God is working through them. They're the ones preaching. They're the ones doing these healings and miracles. Uh, what is being glorified isn't them, is Jesus. He's the one who people are coming to know through this work, and it's a, it's a great reminder for us as we're living, uh, sharing the gospel, uh, trying to strive to live out the righteousness that we are given through Christ. Uh, it's not for us. It's not to build our own kingdom. It's ultimately so that Jesus can be known and glorified. Today's story is actually going to revolve around this guy, King Herod. Now, Herod has uh, been in the Bible earlier than this, uh, that a lot of people probably are more familiar with King Herod. Now, these guys are actually referred to both as Herod, but they are not the same person. The guy most people are familiar with from the gospel story comes at Jesus' birth. It's a guy who wants to find Jesus, uh, to hunt him down, and that is not King Herod. It's actually, that guy would be King Herod the Greater, who is this King Herod, King Herod Antipas's father. And now King Herod that we're looking at today is a guy who is very troubled, who uh, at the time is not held in high esteem. Uh, he's got a lot uh, of, of <clears throat> controversy surrounding him. He's a Jewish man, although even that is up for debate. There's a lot of people who say, well, he's not really a true Jew. He's not ethically Jewish. And uh, as far as practicing the Jewish religion and faith, He's not really great at that. He doesn't have any regard for living out the covenant established between Israel and God. Not highly looked at. In fact, there's a group that we've ran into previously, the Herodians, who are notable because they are Jews who support Herod when most people don't. Most of the people at the time are against him as far as the Jewish people go. And he is not even actually a king. He's referred to King Herod, but he's what is called a tetrarch. That is one of four. He is one of four rulers over Israel put in place by the Roman emperors. The rest of them are his brothers or half-brothers. <clears throat> And he's, uh, yes, he rules over, but he's really just a puppet for the Roman Empire. And there's a lot of scholars who actually believe that when Mark writes about him as King Herod, uh, it's not because he holds him in high esteem. It's actually kind of mocking him. People at the time would refer to him as, as king, not because they beat him as king, because he thought of himself so highly as a king. And it's actually this name uh, comes into play down the line after Jesus is, dies and resurrected, but before Mark writes his gospel, uh, <clears throat> King Herod, at the behest of his wife Herodias, is, is asked to go in front of the Roman Emperor Caligula to now get this title of king. He's gathered more land with the passing of his brother. And when he goes in front of Caligula, instead of getting a promotion, being called king, Caligula instead is like, no, see you, you're banished. He sends him to Spain, strips him of all his land, and is, uh, lives out the rest of his life in Spain. And so Herod uh, will be the focus of our story. 
And then we see what happens. It says, some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah. And others said he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. So we see this picture of kind of what's going on in the midst of Jesus' ministry. The, <clears throat> the beliefs that are forming about Jesus amongst the Jewish people. And we look back, we have the whole story, we look back at him as the Messiah. But the people at the time, uh, by and large, were not looking at him in that light. They were struggling. We actually see the disciples, the closest people to him, throughout his ministry, really wrestling, who is Jesus truly, and it's not until after he dies or close to it that people start realizing he is in fact the Christ, the Messiah. And so we see three prevalent ideas at the time. The first one, there are a lot of people who believe that Jesus is John the Baptist, come back from the dead, and uh, through the work of God, he is performing all these mir miracles. Uh, that odd idea is going to play out in the rest of our story today. Some people just believe he's Elijah, come back from the dead, which would have been significant because Elijah coming back was supposed to mark and pave the way for the eventual Messiah. If you were with us at the beginning of the series, we looked at how John the Baptist is actually the one who comes in the spirit of Elijah to pave uh, the road really for Jesus to begin his ministry. And then the last prevalent belief is that he's just a prophet. He's just another prophet. The prophets had disappeared for a short period of time. This would have been significant to the Jewish people that now the prophets had returned. All of these are ultimately wrong. And then 16, we see Herod's belief. Herod, it says, but when Herod heard of it, he said, John, who I'm beheaded, has been raised. This is <clears throat> this is Herod's belief, and it actually kind of paints a picture of what we're all going to see in this passage, uh, because this isn't just his belief, it's actually shaping how he lives. The idea from some other writings in here is he's now living in this high state of anxiety and fear. He has put John the Baptist to death, had, it, had him beheaded, and now he's like, he's scared. This guy who's performing all the miracles, there's part of him that's worried that John the Baptist has come back to life, he's doing all this miracles, and ultimately, uh, part of what he's going to do is come back for this revenge tour against Herod. Now he's in trouble. He's worried. He doesn't like what he did. Uh, it's a whole mess. And then it goes into this kind of flashback episode. It says, for it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. This is the reason, or the beginning of the reason, why uh, Herod is scared of John, why he's worried, why he has this belief. He's uh, ultimately involved in John's death. And in this statement, though, really reveals the type of man Herod is. He's not a good man. He's not of moral standard. And there's a lot of controversy surrounding him. So uh, at this point in time, or when he, before he arrests John, Herod was married. He's married to a woman whose name I'm going to butcher, something close to Pharrell. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Facel. And his half-brother Philip is married to this woman, Herodias. Now, Herodias, at some point in time, and Herod meets, Herodias has the hots for Herod, and decides, hey, I want to go actually be his husband and not husband to Philip. And she kind of works all of this to the point where Herod divorces his first wife. Uh, Philip ends up divorcing Herodias. Herod and Herodias get together. They get married. Uh, so as you can see, Herod has now married who, uh, his half-brother's wife, who would be therefore his sister-in-law. But it's not just that, <clears throat> because Herodias is also the daughter of Herod's sister, our half-sister. So not only does he marry his sister-in-law, but he also marries his niece. Like this family tree isn't branching. It's not even a straight line. It's like it, it kind of curls back up. And it's through this woman, uh, his wife, who is a schemer, who desires power, that we ultimately see uh, lead to John losing his life. And it said, For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. This is the reason 
that Herodias opposes John. This is why she actually hates him. That John the Baptist, in the midst of his calling from God, this, this, this ministry he leads, that he calls the people of Israel to repentance, he specifically calls out their rulers. He calls out Herod. He calls out Herodias saying, you two are breaking the covenant that God has established. You're not supposed to be married. Herodias' his first husband is still alive. You're breaking the law. Repent. Repent. Turn back to God. Stop sinning. Go back to your spouses. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. Herodias is furious. She hates John the Baptist. She can't stand being called out for her wrongdoing. And she pushes constantly for Herod to have John the Baptist killed. But what we see is that doesn't happen immediately. But she could not. For Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. He actually keeps him safe in the dungeons of his palace. It says, when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. Herod actually thinks very highly of John the Baptist. He thinks he's a good man, a holy man. He doesn't really have a problem with being called out because he agrees he's in the wrong. And the way this is worded, Uh, He actually, after he imprisons him, continues to seek out John the Baptist for wisdom. He goes to him time and time again in his own dungeon because he holds John the Baptist in high esteem. There's this conflict that is brewing amidst the family that ultimately leads to now where we see Herodias' scheming take John's life. It said, But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. This is Herodias' plan in action. Herod gathers all of the important political leaders, military leaders for his birthday, this huge feast. And in the middle of it, it says, For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. So Herodias sends in her daughter, Salome, or Salome, depending on how you pronounce it. He sent, she sends in Salome to dance in front of all of the men that are present. Now, Salome is expected to be somewhere around age 14 at this time. Uh, and she goes in, and the dance that she does is very sexual in nature. Right? It is a dance that is meant to uh, please sexually these men, all of them that, who are watching, including King Herod, Right? And again, now King Herod, we've seen kind of his, his, he's okay with incest. He's okay with this really weird family tree. He's also pleased, gratified by watching his young uh, wife's daughter. Like this guy is a mess. This is like, it belongs in a Jerry Springer episode. It's not good. Just, and, 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 and then he, as he's pleased by watching his wife's daughter, it says, and the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. Because he's pleased, because the men around him are pleased by the dancing of Salome, he makes a pledge to her. He says, I want to reward you. He doesn't know really what to give her. And he uses a statement that's not meant to be taken literally, where he says, I'm going to give you up to half of my kingdom. They would have understood this as a, as a Hebrew idiom. Right? And it meant he wanted to give her something incredibly generous. Like he just wanted to give this lavish gift. Then she was able to ask for anything. It didn't have to like be equal to the, to the gift that she gave him. She was able to ask way above and beyond what would be appropriate. And so Herod has fallen right into the trick, the scheme of Herodias. And when she, that's Salome, went out and said to her mother, for what should I ask? And she, that's that's Herodias, says, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. 
And when his disciples heard of it, that's John the Baptist's disciples, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is just a, a completely terrible story all the way through. Just we see how these people who are ruling the land, uh, they are of a low moral character. They are clearly not following God. Uh, and there's just a lot going on in this story. And it, 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 one of the things that this story is, is right, highlighting the connection between John the Baptist and Jesus. Right? Their ministries are, are intimately connected. Uh, John the Baptist's arrest, and there's a lot of people, scholars who believe this is kind of around the time where Jesus is uh, tempted in the desert. Right? His arrest it kind of marks the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And then also the end of his life is foreshadowing Foreshadowing what is to come for Jesus, where John the Baptist is put to death. It's foreshadowing that this is what is going to happen with Jesus. But it's not just that. It's also really kind of a cautionary tale. It's a cautionary tale about <clears throat> being aware of who is influencing your life. Is who is influencing your life. Because the, the truth is, you are being influenced. At all times, you and I are we are being influenced by the people and the things around you. And those influences are always forming us. They are shaping who we are and how, what we do. They are forming us right in all ways, physically, mentally, emotionally, um, uh, relationally, spiritually, any other Italy you can figure out. Right? We are being formed by the things that influence us. The people and the, really a lot of it is the, the, the things we witness and the media we consume, right? It's not just people. It's not just the things, right? It's, it's the things that we listen to, the music, the shows we watch, the news we watch, on it, the podcasts we listen to. All things at some level are influencing us. And the, the importance of this is we need to be very aware that this is happening whether you like it or not, the things that are around you are influencing you and shaping you. And actually, that's really kind of what is happening in the midst of this story with Herod. <laughs> when, I was, um, when I was in college, it was about a year into my time at college uh, while I was earning my associates. <clears throat> And I had a job at the time. It was uh, still my very first job that I had in high school. I was working at Subway as a sandwich artist, and I uh, I could not stand this job. It was my least favorite job maybe that I've ever had. It was just boring. We were super slow, and I desperately wanted something new to do. And while I was at college, I met this guy who became a, a good friend of mine, at least at the time, and he would always tell me what a great job he had. He worked at a car dealership, was a lot attendant. He was like, it's awesome. It pays better than your job. And also, we have a lot of freedom. You should come work for me. And I constantly, okay, I want to come work. He said, well, actually, we don't have a space. Until one day they did. He came into school. He said, hey, bud, uh, they actually, one of the guys at work, he just walked off the job. You should go apply because I think you get the job. And I was jacked. I went to the dealership immediately following uh, school getting out. And I put in my application. I actually got the job right on the spot. They're like, oh, yeah, your buddy's been vouching for you. Uh, you got the job. When can you start? I was so excited, and I went to this job. Uh, right, I got uh, done a week early at my previous job. I went in and started. I was so happy. Uh, and it became apparent that this was a place I was not at all ready to work at. Like, I was not prepared for what was happening there. And uh, for a lot of people, car dealerships, they have a stereotype about them, uh, which I've come to realize over the years, like, that's not true for our dealerships. There are a lot of dealerships uh, with great people who have high morals, uh, but there is also a lot of dealerships uh, that have created this stereotype. And this dealership uh, fell definitely into that side of the, uh, they, they exceeded the stereotype. Very quickly, I realized, right, this was not a healthy work environment. The people who were worked there were not mature or healthy. There were no followers of Christ. Like, and it was, it was just, it was bad. It was terrible. It, my time there, I witnessed during the midst of my work, people uh, doing hard drugs, people watching pornography, uh, lots of sexual harassment. There was fraud cases that were happening. We actually got raided uh, by the state because several of our dealers were falsifying work uh, documents for loans for the bank. Like this place was a mess. 
And as I saw this, right, I'm like, well, I'm making some more money. And it doesn't matter because I'm a really good guy. I believe in Jesus. Everything's going to work out. And I was just naive. I was wrong. And about six months down the line, I remember very specifically how this place was influencing me and really corrupting me, even though I believed it was doing none of that. I, about six months down the line, I remember sitting in the back wash bay. We would be back by ourselves cleaning cars, and we had pulled around a Pontiac Aztec. I remember very specifically because Pontiac Aztec may be the ugliest car I've ever seen, uh, but it had something really special about it. The center console wasn't a regular center console. In fact, it was kind of cool. It was a detachable cooler. Uh, and <coughs> we chose that car because of the cooler. And so me and my buddy, we sat down in the car. We grabbed our cleaning stuff. We cleaned up a little bit. And we did all this. So in case anybody came back, it looked like we were working. But what we were really doing was we were listening to music and drinking a six-pack of beer. And we were thinking, man, this is the life. We're getting paid to drink and do nothing like we've got it made. Everything that was going on around me was influencing me in a completely negative direction. I had entered there thinking, hey, right, I'm an upstanding guy. I'm going to be a light in the middle of the darkness. And six months later, I'm making just completely dumb, immature, immoral, and sometimes illegal, right, decisions. And fortunately, uh, about six months later or so, I left the job, and I look back at it not just now, but then, like, what a mess that was, and, and what, a, what a great lesson for me to learn, that the people around me, whether I knew it or not, were shaping me. They were shaping me. They were influencing me. They were changing how I lived, how I thought, what I did, and that's the reality for each and every one of us. Regardless of our intentions, regardless of what we desire, the people and things around us are influencing us and shaping us. And we need to be extra careful about how, what we are surrounding ourselves with. That's what happens with King Herod. What strikes me about his story isn't just what he does, but how conflicted of a man that he is, right? History is not kind to King Herod. They look at him as an evil man, and he is ultimately responsible for all he did. But it struck me in the midst of all of this that he's really wrestling, right? When Herodias wants him to be put to death, John, right, is unwilling to do that. He arrests him. But what we see is he still looks at John as a righteous and holy man. He does this ultimately to keep him safe, and he continues to go to him for advice. He actually, right, that says something about Herod. Here's a guy, John, who has publicly spoken out against him for his wrongdoing, and Herod's like, yeah, you're right. I'm not going to do anything about it, but you're right. And in fact, I'm going to continue to look at you positively right? We see Herod is wrestling, and yet he's being influenced by the people. And when he goes to have John the Baptist beheaded, he makes a terrible decision. It says, though, he was exceedingly sorry. Herod doesn't desire to have John the Baptist put to death. He puts him to death, right, because Right, because he gives in to the demands of his wife. He puts him to death because it says his guests, the people around them, he doesn't want to lose face in the midst of them, and they don't care if this happens. In fact, what he does, he puts himself in a position where he has no good choice. He, he, either way, he's in the wrong. He has to break an oath that he just made to Salome, or he has to put a man to death. Right, Both of them sins. One of them far outweighs the other, but he's, he's trapped himself. And the decisions that he makes, right, he doesn't choose the best of two bad decisions. He chooses the one that the other people are going to approve of. Herod threw it all, and I want to highlight, like, he is ultimately responsible for this, but he is being influenced through all of this. And he's not, unbeknownst to him, he is allowing this influence to ultimately shape what he does. Again, this is the reality for all of us. The people around us are constantly influencing us and shaping us and guiding our actions in life. 
And one of the lies that I think I bought into that I see a lot of people buy into is that we're just going to be upright people. And these things, we're going to resist the influence, right? That we're the exception to this. But that's not how it works. It's not how it works. We are always going to be influenced by the people around us. And this is actually something that is well known throughout all of human history. I went and looked because there's a, there's a quote that I had heard and I wanted to say it right and attribute it to the right person. The idea that you show me a person's closest five friends and I will show you their character. And I actually couldn't find who to attribute it to because throughout all of human history, there's quotes or proverbs or, or writings that ultimately say the same thing. There's an ancient Chinese proverb. There's an ancient Japanese proverb. Uh, Vladimir Lenin said something of the matter. Uh, Wolfgang said something. The Apostle Paul writes something similar in Corinthians. It's written, uh, not the same thing, but the same idea in Psalms. All throughout human history, across cultures, people have understood this truth. You are being influenced by the things around you. You will become what they are. And while we all know it, I don't think we prepare for it. I don't think we believe it that it's true about us. I don't think we truly believe it. We always think we're going to rise above this. We have to be prepared. We have to be aware. And we have to fight back against what is influencing us. (laughs) And one of the great things about the gospel is that, is that it equips us to resist this one, right? We're redeemed, we are declared righteous, and then, right, God, through the Holy Spirit, he's making us righteous. We have what should be the greatest influence in our lives. We have the Holy Spirit uh, empowering us, pushing us, speaking to us, whatever you want to call it, making us aware of where we should be moving and going when we listen. But not only that, we have something more. Part of our our gift, part of what we receive through the gospel is we have been redeemed to a holy family. God has equipped us to fight back against the influences of our desires, of the world, of Satan. He has redeemed us to a holy family. That is the church. That we have been gifted with the tools to resist this influence. We have we have a group of people around us who are our brothers and sisters in Christ who when we engage in real true relationship and right, it can't just be an hour on a Sunday coming to sing some songs and listen to a sermon. Right? There's this is supposed to be much more than that. Right? The people around you should be the greatest influence in your life. It should be them who are holding you accountable and encouraging you and ultimately striving to achieve the righteousness of Christ, striving to live out his mission together. We have the tools, right, to fight back this corrupting influence that is around us, to surround ourselves with godly influence. But we have to make a conscious choice to engage in God's community. I think it's it's important for each of us to ask ourselves deeply, what is influencing, what is truly influencing our lives. The other thing I want to look at in this story is that following God is costly. Following God is costly. Right? That's what happens in this story. John the Baptist, he is doing exactly what God has called him to, to, to preach this, this repentance, this call of repentance, to call out the religious leaders, the, the government leaders, to call them back to God, to right living. And what it is that ultimately costs him is his life. He's beheaded because he chooses to follow God. And that <coughs> John the Baptist, right, it cost him his life. That, but that's, and that's not going to be what it costs most or really any of us. We, we live 21st century America. This is not going to be probably the reality for any of us. Right? There have been plenty of people throughout human history who have been martyred for their faith. We may not have to worry about this, but this is the truth for us, that following God is costly. And I say that not because really we can do anything about that, but it's a good reminder as we follow God that when we run into some kind of persecution, when things happen because of our faith, it should be expected. It should be expected that following God, striving to look like him, to look like he has declared us, um, following him will cost us. 
It may cost us financially. It may cost us relationally. It may mean that we have to give up building our own kingdom. We're going to have to surrender all things to him. It's going to cost us throughout our life at some level. We will have to be prepared for this reality. And it will happen. I've, there's been throughout my life, it's happening to people I know right now who are choosing to follow Christ, who have decided that because they're following Christ, they have to live a different way. And simply doing that, not speaking out against other people, not, not judging others, but simply by saying, I'm going to look different because of what Christ has done in me. Right? I'm watching them lose relationships friendships that have existed for 5, 10, 15 years. People are turning against them, calling them hypocrites, cussing them out, whatever it may be, right? They are losing things. People I know who are saying, I have to leave jobs because I can't, I can't stand by and allow this to happen, right? Following Christ is costly. But following Christ, right, the cost is always, always worth the reward. I'm gonna go ahead and release the campus pastors. I love you guys. Have a good day. Thanks for sticking around. Our transformational moment for today is this question, who or what is truly influencing your life? And I know for, if you're a follower of Christ, like Jesus is the biggest influence in your life, or at least should be. But I want us to go beyond that question. I really want us to wrestle with who or what are the things that are really influencing our life. And really, to answer that question, you just really need to look at where are you spending your time? Who, who are you around most of the time? What are you watching or listening most of the time? Because that is what is influencing you, right? And, and, and then to take a good hard look, is this a worthwhile influence? Is this a good thing? And maybe sometimes, right, there are some things that we just can't get around, right? If, if you happen to be around family and that's where you're at in life and they're not a positive influence, like don't abandon your family. But there are times in our life, sometimes what we watch, consume, the people we're choosing to spend around us, right, they're having a deep influence us. And if we're going to follow Christ, sometimes we need to make that hard choice. Are they a good influence or do I need to, to make some hard choices in my life? Thank you, guys. I'll see you later.